Am I on? Okay. Well, it is a treat to be uh, with you today. Uh, I, I am going to share that my oldest daughter, Cassie, is 21, and she came to us just a few years ago. Uh, and, and so when I shared with my, my family that I would uh, be here today, she just had this physical reaction, uh, this disappointment that she wasn't going to be able to be here uh, as well, uh, because it turns out um, that she and, and her mom used to, uh, used to attend here years ago. And uh, so she's like, oh, that, just, that would just feel like home. Um, and so uh, her mom and her uh, found great fellowship and, and caregiving here and um, when she came to be part of our family a few years ago after her mom passed, uh, it has been a, a wonderful season. But I just want you to know that she's a little jealous. And there's not too much that, you know, to make a 21-year-old jealous of, you know, the, so I'm, I'm thrilled. But it is a treat to be with you uh, this morning. I am eager for us to, uh, to get into the Word, and so we're going to dive right on in. Uh, let's pray. Lord God. You are so good. You are so good. And you are the author and perfecter of life and of faith. You gave a mission to the church, and then you lead the way. You go before us, you come behind us, and you hem us in on all sides. You empower and equip us with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so roam among us, Holy Spirit, in this time, in this space. Do as you would as you speak your word through the words that, that come out of my mouth, through the meditations that have come out of my heart that you have stirred. Lord, would you translate those? They would not return void, but that they would meet each and every person at the point of their need for your glory, for your kingdom. Amen. Anybody feel like they need some good news? I have some good news for you. Jesus Christ, he's alive. And he's here. And he is ready, he is able, he is passionately committed to meeting every single person at the point of their need. And, and that's why we gather, that's why we worship. Because he alone is, is worthy of our worship, but he also changes everything. And if you have been walking with him for a, a long season, then you know it. And it's your testimony. And if you are new to that walk, and you're just kind of exploring it and, and experiencing it, let's, <laughs> brothers and sisters, let's be bearers of truth. There is no journey like it. It is so good. Nothing else compares. And the water that just went flying. <laughs> Can I say that I was a little worried about that? There's nothing else that compares to it. I've been walking with the Lord for, for a long time now. I didn't grow up in a Christian family. Um, so my walk started uh, later than, than maybe a lot of folks. But, uh, but what I have discovered, in not only is that walk everything, not only is there life and hope and peace and purpose in that, there is also deep and abiding assurance. And there are days and there are seasons when I wake up, and if you've been on the journey for a while, you wake up too and say, how did I end up here? <laughs> what happened? I think I need to circle back and do a do-over. Do Having three kids, if I could go and have do-overs, Boy, that would be good. I think they're kind of glad they've just kind of like lived through it the first round and don't want to go back and go through it again, right? But, but here is the truth, and I hope you'll receive it, is that God 
paves the way. God opens the doors. He goes ahead of us. And when we get off track, he will, he will give us indication. Sometimes it's painful. But he will, he will draw us right back because through him is life and life abundant. And it's why he came. It's why the God who's God over all that is, who is sovereign, he left the glory of heaven to come and to, to lead and to show and to invite us into a life that he had designed, he had ordained, that he celebrates and he calls out in for you and for me. That's the good news. So when the Lord led me to a, a passage in the book of Haggai, has anybody familiar with it with Haggai? It's one of those little prophets. You have like the big, you have the major prophets and the minor prophets. But that the distinction is really only made because of the amount of words, not because of the impact. It's not that one is, is more important than, than the other. And so the book of Haggai, uh, he 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 brought uh, he brought forward, and I, I'm eager to share the word with you this morning. And so I want to set it up a little bit uh, because in, in the book of Haggai, the, the prophet Haggai, uh, what we encounter is a people, the, the people of God, who have been through a lot. And, and now they are on the brink of, of a new day. And it matters how they respond. It matters how they posture themselves before God. And so I want to introduce that to you. In order to do it, I, I feel like I really kind of need to, to set it up uh, just a little bit. So I'm going to set the stage. I'm going to kind of uh, skip the stone over the pond so to introduce you to uh, where, where they are. There was a, a time in which uh, God, as he brought, uh, brought his people together and built a nation... There is a kingdom, the kingdom that, uh, that you're familiar with, King Saul and, and King David and King Solomon. And it was the kingdom of, of, of Israel. It was the God's people under in this, this kingdom that would eventually split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Because after Solomon, his son went to take, um, take over the, to be the, the new king, uh, Rehoboam, and people were not really a fan of him, and so they split. And so there was Jeroboam and there was Rehoboam, and the, the kingdom split between the northern and the southern. And, and there was a time in, in this split where <laughs> nobody, was, was <laughs> nobody was getting it right. God, who had led them out of Egypt... God who had provided and brought them into the promised land, there was still such a, a liaison fair about who they were as God's people that it drew them again and again into a place of living as if God did not matter. And so in this split, the split happened in 928 uh, BC, and, and God sent prophets to tell, to tell his people to, to, to live faithfully. He had given them so much. He had given them an identity. He had given them himself. He had given them the temple. He had given them the instructions on how to, to live according to the, to the law. He gave them uh, this, this call to be a light to the nations. And they were not doing it. And so he sent prophets to speak truth and to remind and, and to challenge and to no avail. And so in, uh, in 722, the, the dates are important for, you'll see why in a moment. In 722, uh, the, the northern kingdom was wiped out. The Assyrians came in, took over, they went into exile. But for another 150 years, the, the southern kingdom continued. That's the kingdom of Judah. And the, 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 the capital of that city was Jerusalem, where the temple was. 
But in 606 BC, 606 BC, the first wave came and exiled to begin the, the, the plan of exile for, for even Judah. The Babylonians came into power in the first wave in 606, and then again in, in 597, and then again in 596, and then again in 587. And so in 587, the people of God wake up, and they are in Babylon. And all the great people of God are with them. And no one is in Jerusalem. And they are in exile. They're in exile for 70 years. If you start with like the 606, okay? They're in exile for 70 years. And then this guy, this guy, he's actually a king. I'm going to try really hard not to fall on that, okay? <laughs> this king, King Cyrus... He declared in 539, remember the dates are important right now, and you'll know why in a minute. In 539, they had conquered so much of the world, and he had a little bit of a problem. Because now they had, because it wasn't just Israel, okay? It wasn't just Judah. It wasn't, it wasn't just one pocket of people. They had taken over so much of the world, and so in this one moment, he said, okay, pull you know what? We've got all of these people. And what do we do with all of these people cramped here? Let's send them back home. We're still in control. But let's spread them out. Let's send them back home. Tell them to go ahead and rebuild their, their temples. And so he sends a, a decree out for the, for the people of God to go back and to, to Judah, to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Out of a million people in exile, only 50,000 go. They don't want to go. They have a new life. It may not be the perfect life, but they have friends and they have a garden and they have jobs. And, and so he sends them and only 50,000 go. And so that, that edict that came down in, in 539, by 536, there are about 50,000 Israelites in Jerusalem. He was doing the same all over the place. It wasn't just... But if you, if you read, uh, if you read in, in, from the book of Ezra, you'll, you'll see the edict that, that comes down. And so there's actually the actual edict... You know, we have a copy of it in the UN building in New York City. Now, it's not the one to the people of God. It was actually the one written where their God was Marduk. But it was like a form letter to all these groups of people. Like, hey, go home. Go home. Reestablish, you know, your things. We'll even help pay for it. You're still under our rule. <laughs> and so he sends them. And in 536, they go. Well, those who go, go. If you have your Bibles and you can find Haggai, which is in the Old Testament after the, the big prophets, then join me there. In the second year, this is chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm just going to kind of work through the, the, the passage here. In the second year of King Darius... On the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoadadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. What I want to draw your attention to is that in this book, you'll, you'll read um, over and over that in the second year of King Derek, in the first day of the sixth month, it's a date, it's a calendar. And, and there's several dates actually in, in this book and really all through, uh, all through the scriptures. 
Why that's important is because what I said is that it was 539 B.C. when uh, King Sirius sent them. Well, now you translate this. It is now 520 B.C. 520 B.C. and now it's King Darius on the throne. The people of God who had been in exile were sent back to Jerusalem, and it's been 16 years, and they have not been building the temple that was destroyed. Remember, God had given them a temple. It was built under Solomon. And it was this beautiful, wonderful temple. And the people of God gathered there and they worshiped God there. They, they offered their sacrifices there. They lived out being the people of God there. And, and the destruction of that temple in 586 B.C. when they were completely ex exiled, it just stood in ruins. So they went back. It's been 16 years and what the Lord says is, these people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Well, I don't know what it is they thought they were waiting on. You know, in all transparency, since you don't know me, but maybe some of you can relate to this, that my husband and I got married. We were pretty young. I think I was 22. He was 24. By the time I was 35. Can you imagine how many people had given up on the fact that we were having children? Right? Because we, we didn't have any children. We were 35 years old. Well, I was 35. He was 37. They said, if you were going to do that, you were going to do that, right? We have three children now. The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Consider your ways. It's been 16 years. What's your priority? I gave you instruction. What are you doing? All those instructions that we, that it, gave, it got you into exile. Now you have returned home. And I don't know what ways you're considering, but probably not mine. Consider your ways. And then verse 6. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Every time you turn around, you have less and less of what you're working for. It's like in, in inflation is just like eating your lunch. When they returned, they actually returned with, with resources, with, uh, with, with silver and, and gold. And instead of using that silver and gold to build, to rebuild the temple that God wanted them to rebuild, they got a little nervous and they started building their own homes. Well, you know, I got to make sure that I have, I have food and my family has food, so we got to do the garden. We'll get, to the, we'll get to the house. And one priority after another. <laughs> this is what the Lord Almighty says. Verse 7. Consider your ways. Okay, in Hebrew, when, when something gets repeated, it's like, you know, mama who says, don't make me come up there. Right? Because I have told you, are you listening? So again, consider your ways. Do an internal review. 
Go up, and then he gives instruction again, go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Again, he gives instruction. He tells them exactly what, what he wants them to do. He wants them to rebuild the, the temple. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. That's a tough reading. What you brought home, I blew away. God is taking ownership. He's taking responsibility for what felt like a lot of work for, for fewer and fewer returns. He's saying, you were missing the mark. I'm not going to let you get ahead that way. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, my house which I told you to go and to rebuild, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because you have the heavens, because of you, the heavens have withdrew their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and then the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces on people and livestock and all the labor of your hands. So you want to know? You want to know how I feel? Says the Lord. I want you to remember what you're doing here. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, Joshua, son of Zodidak, Zo Josahak, the high priest and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message from the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. They heard and, and they responded. They heard and and, and it had their attention. And, and here's the thing, or one of the things, is that there was, a, there was a panic mode that they had been in to secure themselves before they tended to the house of the Lord. But the reality is that God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. God's work done God's way will never lack supply. They weren't doing what God had told them to do. And all they felt were the holes in their pocket for all the effort, all the work. And then God identified it and called them back to the priority, build the temple, rebuild my home. Now, <laughs> verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, and governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoadadak, and the, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people of God. They came and they began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. Remember those dates? The date is now September 21st, 520 B.C. In three weeks, God changed the outcome of the people based on their obedience. Three weeks. The time frame is so exciting. 
the time frame to, to have a moment of clarity of when we wake up, it's like, well, how did I end up exactly here? Oh, all right, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be over here. And our God is a God of do-overs, of realignment, of grace and mercy and go forth. And as he does, he says, I am with you, declares the Lord. I am with you. Do you remember, does it sound familiar to you? I, I am I'm with you. Remember when, when God called, when God called Moses? I mean, actually, God didn't only call Moses to, uh, to, to lead his people out of Pharaoh's land and into the promised land. Okay, he, he also, It was a bigger call than that. But the first call was go to, go to Pharaoh, and we're going to bring my people out. Do you remember what Moses' response was? I don't talk so good, God. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm the person to do that. What did God say? I am with you. And he gave him some other tools in the staff. I love that story. Remember the, the story of the, the staff where he's throw the staff. You know, he has the staff. It's just a piece of, it's, just a, it's a stick. It's, it's worthless. It's nothing. A dime a dozen, a penny a dozen. There was not, right? They were just all over. God says, throw the stick on the ground. And he throws the stick on the ground, and it was a snake. And he said, now pick the snake up. I'm thinking, no, I was just going to go that way, you know? And, and he did, and it turned back into his staff. Do you remember that? And he stuck his, he said, okay, put your, your hand in your cloak. And we pulled it out. It was leprous. He said, okay, put it back in. He put it back in, and he brought it back out. And it was healed. God was showing him that I am with you. I am not calling you to do something that I am not equipping you to do. You do what I tell you to do. You go the way I'm telling you to go. Do it the way I tell you to do it. And I have resources you cannot imagine. When Moses left in obedience, it says he took the staff of God with him. Earlier in the story, it was just a staff. Now it was the staff of God Almighty. And those are two very different things. They're very different things. And so he says, he says the message, I am with you. Imagine how they would hear that. The people of God. This was not a distant memory for them, you know, of, of, of thousands of years. To hear the stories of God's faithfulness. I am with you. And then chapter 2, verse 1. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. This is now October. October 17th, still 520 BC. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehoadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? If you were to read about, if you were, re, if you were to read about this, uh, this experience in, 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 in Ezra, Ezra gives a different kind of account of it. And, and, and the picture that he gives is this. That, okay, so now the people of God are, are faithfully beginning the rebuild. Quickly. And faithfully. 
But check it out for yourself, Ezra chapter 3, okay? That those who had seen, those who were older, who had seen the first temple, they began weeping. The younger people, they were rejoicing. And and together, the commotion that was created was so loud, it says they could just hear it like beyond the town. Why were they weeping? Why were they weeping? The older folks were weeping because they remembered. They knew what it was like when the temple was the original temple. And What's being rebuilt isn't as big. And it's not as fine. It's different. And so there was grieving and there was loss and there was pain. But you know what they weren't noticing? They were so, uh, they were so aware of their own loss and their own grief that they missed the joy And the praise that was erupting from those who hadn't been there the first time. Because they just saw, this is what the Lord is doing. This is what God is building and I'm a part of it. And so hear hear this. God acknowledges it. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like it's nothing? That is is the Lord God Almighty having great compassion on those who are heartbroken. And then he says, verse 4, Take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage, Joshua, son of Jehozadak. I finally got that name right. I was really hoping we could stop with that name because it is just a tongue twister. Take courage. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. The point that God is is making is don't miss the point of the temple because the temple is not the prize. I am the prize. I am with you. I am the prize. I don't want you to build the temple because I need a temple. You know what? Hey, I made the Grand Canyon. I don't want you to build the temple because I need a place to rest and to receive the honor and glory. No, 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 no. I don't need a cathedral. I can make a cathedral. I have made cathedrals that you have not even discovered out of stalactites and stalagmites. I don't need that. I want there to be a temple because you're my people. And I want you to encounter and walk with me. And you need the temple so that we can have intimacy. I want the temple because I know you. I know how easy it is to get fleet, you know, just fleet through life and be distracted. And so I want you to build the place not because I need it, but because I love you and you're my people and I know that you need it. I am the prize. Prize is intimacy with God. It's the intimacy with God. I have been in the church 
my entire adulthood. And there are seasons when the body of Christ gets distracted. And there are seasons when there is a remnant that says, I'm going to hold out because the God who's God over all that is, I'm with him. He's touched me. And my life is different because of it. And there is a, a world outside of the temple that needs to encounter the overwhelming love of God. So I hang on. And I allow God to lead. And when I take a moment and I, and I, I, I wake up and I realize, well, how did I get here? then I stand on the very promise that in a moment, in a moment, I can lay that down before the Lord and he will bring me right back. In this season, in this moment of your life, I don't know what that looks like. But what I can tell you is this, because it's truth. As brothers and sisters, we stand on the word of God. We claim it. We allow God to, to speak through it, even when it, you know, messes, meddles in our stuff. Because he is the author and perfecter of life. And he is with you. He is with the body of Christ here at Bay Point. And he blesses obedience. The season ahead, you can lean into it and feel all kinds of the whole gamut of emotions. But I'm going to submit, I'm going to encourage that you lean into it with a kind of joy and anticipation and expectation that the Lord God Almighty, who is the I am, is right here. And he has a life and a purpose and a hope for you and for Bay Point that is going to touch this community is going to be part of his work of transforming the world because he did not come in vain. So lean into that. It may cost you something. There may be paneling on your house. It was finally your turn to get the paneling on your house. When the prophet shows up and says, why are you buying all that paneling? We're going to go and rebuild the temple. But lay it down. It's your faithful response, your obedience. The Lord God will, oh, he will bless that. Holy Spirit, I love that you are here. I love that you will take your word and you will stir it and you will continue to, to speak truth and, and to give, convict and to, to heal Would you do that even now, even now in these last moments where, where we are in your house together? Would you do that among us now? Would you give us a heart, each one of us, for obedience and faithfulness, for a sensitivity to hear where you are leading and to say yes, for your glory? for your kingdom, and even for our own good. Amen.